The Meeples and Miniatures podcast is sponsored by Two Fat Lardies and Coat and Arms Paints. And also by the generous donations of you, the listener. Thank you to everyone for your support. The Meeples and Miniatures podcast, episode 110. Star Wars Gaming. With hosts Neil Shook, Rich Jones and Mike Hobbs. The show was recorded during May and June 2013. Welcome to another episode of the Meeples and Miniatures podcast with me, your host, Neil Shook. Now, this show has had a a bit of an interesting gestation. Back in the middle of May, uh, Rich Jones, my cobs and myself uh, recorded what was going to be the next Meeples and Miniatures show. And we were going to chat about various things to do with, uh, with science fiction. For one reason or another, that show became... Uh, a bit ranty, uh, very waffly, and I was wondering whether, uh, to be honest, it would ever see the light of day. Uh, having said that, you know, we recorded uh, a, a lot of good bits and pieces, and so I decided to try and uh, chop it around a bit, uh, separate out a few bits and pieces, and try and maybe put you know several shows together. Especially since we were recording ooh, something like three hours worth of material, so. This show is the first result of that process. Um, I mean, apologies for uh, why it's taken so long to come out. Uh, But actually, uh, there's a lot more work involved than what I first thought. Now, obviously, the one problem with this particular thing is that we are now talking uh, essentially back in time by about a month. And for whatever reason, at times, uh, a month can be a long time in wargaming. So uh, there are certain issues that we raise... Uh, that have since passed uh, events that we talk about like UK Games Expo and stuff which uh, at the time were in the future but obviously are now past and you know a few other bits and pieces so all that being said uh, I still think it's worth a listen we talk about uh, all things to do with Star Wars gaming all the stuff we're involved in at the moment so uh, we're talking about X-Wing we're talking about Star Wars the card game, and uh, we're also talking about Star Wars the role-playing game, and uh, much more of that to come in future, and I'll explain uh, after the um, the main part of the show. So, I hope you'll find this next uh, 45 minutes or so uh, fairly useful, and then I'm going to come back, uh, add a few more comments Uh, talk about uh, a couple of things that have happened since this main part of the show was originally recorded and we'll wrap up from there okay right so we'll take a quick break and when we come back uh, it'll be um, coming into the middle of uh, a conversation that uh, is ongoing between myself rich jones and mike hobbs I don't like it, Sergeant. Me neither, sir. Good Lord. It's really looking pretty bad. Yes, sir. It happens every time, sir. It's too predictable, sir. How far do you think we've uh, we've advanced, Sergeant? Six inches, sir. It's always six inches. We advance six inches, then Jerry gets a go. The lads are uh, are calling it Hygo Hugo, sir. Hygo Hugo? And they don't like it, sir. Oh, not like it. Uh, Well, uh, 
It seems pretty straightforward to me, rather like cricket. We have an innings, then uh, the other chap does. Well, that's all very well, sir, cricket, sir, but begging your pardon, it ain't like that, sir, in war. I don't think Mr. Hitler plays like that. What, Hitler? No, gosh, he would like to go all the time. Oh, no, sir, lovely. Oh, well, well, sir, anyway, sir, it's like this, sir. If it carries on like this, I go, you go. Me and the lads won't be coming to your Thursday evening games club. And that's the way it is, sir. Looking for more of a challenge with your World War II games? Are you tired of the predictability of I go, you go systems? I ain't been shot, Mum. Provides real command challenges on an unpredictable battlefield. Two fat lollies, playing the period and not the rules since 2002. Pip, pip. L- let's talk about a game that we all love. Um, and and yes, I, and yes, I have to say that yes. You've got what did you say? You got I, I, yeah, I got off it now. This is a rubbish game I lost last time I played. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I give you, go- I give both of you guys permission to turn around to me and say, "I told you so." No, we, we don't see it as more. I told you so. Is we were just nurturing the right positive thoughts in your head until you caved in. <laughs> until I caved in and bought it. Yes. yes. We, we are, of course, talking about... We were using the force to... <laughs> oh, is you. that what you call it? <laughs> if you were walking downstairs, feeling your throat tightened, that was me and Mike, <laughs> sitting at home going... <laughs> yes, why is my hand moving towards the mouse? Why am I going, by this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, we are, Those are not the Kickstarters you're looking, looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yes, as opposed to these are the models that you are looking for. You just can't buy them at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, hey! We said we weren't going to moan. Oh, okay, okay, go, all right, okay. Yes, we're talking about, uh, of course, um, Extreme Miniatures game from uh, Fantasy Flight Games, which uh, I've finally bought, got into, played, and love. Told you. <laughs> <laughs> and as you say, game immediately out the box that you can get out and play in five minutes, but don't do what Mike advised me to do, which is just ignore the basic game. Ignore the quick... Sorry, ignore the quick... Uh, ignore the kickstart... Uh, the kickstart... I've got, I've, got, I've got kickstart in the Don't brain. play the quick play rules. That's, that's the one. Don't play the quick play rules. Just dive straight into the full game, because the, because the quick play rules make life far too easy, especially if you're an yeah. X-Wing pilot. <laughs> Yeah, but it gives you an idea of how the rules play. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah. I mean, we did it for two turns, and then we just yeah. picked up the rest yeah. of the main rules. It was just if, if, you, if you're a gamer, you don't need them, but if it's like lots of people who aren't gamers, that's their first venture into sort of miniatures after board games, then you need it. So, there we are, so, I think. Yeah, so I got it and then got a load of grief from, from Rich because I went, oh, I bought it and I bought a mat. <laughs> hey, the mats are good. They are superb. They are yeah. really nice. And of course, Rich, you've got a mat now, haven't you? I've got a mat. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of it? I was it? getting out for getting a mat. It has to be said that the mat. I was getting out for getting a star mat. Hmm? I was getting out for getting a, a black mat. That's what I've gone for. I thought the yeah. generic um, space station one is well. It, you're going to lose ships and, and um, the asteroids on that. So I've gone for a nice generic black one. Why would you have asteroids on a. Uh, yeah, above a space station. Because it's in one of the scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not in the scenarios. It's it's the tournament rules. Yeah. Which uh, yeah, you have to have the asteroids. Or the, the I've got the space station map. Yeah. And it looks really nice until you start taking photos, and then all the models. It's the best camouflage I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Yeah, Cloaking well, device. <laughs> It's all right when you're sitting at table level, sort of looking across them. As soon as you go above it and take the photos, that's it. It's just like, you got those ships on there? Yes, I have. Where? I don't know. See, you should have bought a nice spacey one like what we did. I've got a spacey one too. Oh, you got both, oh, got both of them. Oh, what you would say? Oh, you just keep me quiet about that. <laughs> but that's so you can play really big games, Switch. Yeah. <laughs> But I mean, I mean, the only thing I can get out. I mean, if, if people don't, know, the, the, these are the mats that Gale Force Nine have, been, uh, um, have produced for the game, and they are this I mean, this wonderful 
thin vinyl material which lays out is completely you know it doesn't have any creases seems to statically cling to whatever surface you lay it out on and it's they're, they're, they're lovely they're nice they're expensive but they're nice yeah they're, they're, i they mean they're not cheap you know. i mean fancy flyer bringing out their their tile kit hmm yeah Very that's soon. be interesting to see um I don't know whether down the line that's going to be the tournament standard thing you have to play on, but it'll be interesting, I think, when they come out. It's, it's, I mean, I've got my reservations. Yeah, just. It's, it's interesting because it's interesting that they brought it out separately because as far as I was aware, uh, and this is all to do with legal stuff, so this is spoken with the caveat of I believe this to be the original situation, was that Lots of people turned around and said, why didn't they bring out a board or a mat or something when they produced the game in the first place? And I think it boils down to it's something to do with the licensing and the fact that they own the license from, uh, I suppose it's Disney now, to produce miniatures games for Star Wars. But they don't own the license to produce a board game for board Star game. Wars because that's owned by Hasbro. I think it's Hasbro. So they couldn't bring out the game with a board as yeah. a complete thing because then it would be a board game. Yeah, so they, can, what, they can release a, a, a generic space board separately. Yes. Yeah. And it's double-sided. One side happens to be have things like Death Stars and stuff on them. You know, but there you go. But it, it will be interesting to see what they come out at, at what, what price point they are and that sort of thing. I think they're going to be quite competitive. I mean, my my only fear with them, I'll probably end up getting them, but I just wonder what it's going to be like. Because you, well, all three of us know how the game works. There's a lot of sort of like pushing. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, I, I just my fear is the tiles are just going to slip everywhere without any sort of connectors. Yeah. Uh, but we we'll wait and see, I suppose. Mm. But back to the game. Yeah, but back to the game, yeah. So I've picked up a couple of the original boxes, uh, uh, but at the moment, some of the, uh, uh, especially Wave 1 stuff, is like locking all sorts of it, isn't it? Try and get hold of. Yeah, Wave 1 is difficult to get hold of. You can still get hold of a lot of the Wave 2 stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, they, uh, a lot of people had a restock of uh, a restock of Wave Two about three or four weeks ago. Uh, allegedly, mm. Wave One is supposed to be restocked in June, but I think yeah. it, again, maybe it's actually one of these things that, as far as Fantasy Flight is concerned, the game has taken off in a way that they never envisaged it would, and maybe yeah, and maybe that's the issue. Yeah, I mean, imagine that you know when you're planning a new game, you've got to sort of get your orders in for you know. How many actually do you want them to produce? Oh, um, 10,000, 15,000, they all cost money. What happens if, if the game doesn't sell, we're going to be sunk? Mm. Well, let's just do the, you know, an amount that we know that's going to sell and pray to God that we can get, get the restock in place in six weeks. You know, sort of I, I think, saga. Yeah, I think what might have, I don't know, I'm just completely surmising yeah. on my part, is that the competitive side of it, it's been a lot more popular than they ever imagined because you can play the game without i mean basically the, we're talking about getting the extra expansions for x-wing and yeah. the tie fighter which mm. are impossible to get mm. completely impossible to get until until the restock yeah you now, can get all the y-wings well you, you, yeah there was a small amount of y-wings around somewhere they, they were yeah yeah but you could still get those it's the x-wing and the ties that are the the original expansions, which are the, the hard things to get. Yeah. And that wouldn't matter an iota in the big scheme of things if it wasn't for competitive play, because basically you can buy another box set and it's better value for money and you get more X-Wings and type. What people want are the pilot, the pilot cards, cards and the upgrades that go mm. in the first two things. And the only reason you really want those because otherwise you can download them and photocopy them or whatever, is to play in a competitively. Yes. So yeah. I imagine it's the competitive side of it that's caught them, you know, blindsided them, rather than the whole way the game's taken off. Mm. Mm. That makes sense? 
yeah, 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 yeah. We've seen it. I mean, it's like uh, UK Games Expo uh, have got an X-wing tournament this year, and it's like, oh, I'll, uh, now normally most game tournaments at the UK Games Expo, you know, you can mosey in a few weeks after a few weeks after sign up, and you can normally pick up one or two spaces, even on tournaments that only have like sixteen spaces or what have you. And there were was it fifty two spaces on the X-wing tournament, and they went like that; they were gone. <laughs> Well, there was 40 something and they went almost instantly. Yeah. And then they negotiated more space and it went up and up and now it's, I think the absolute cutoff is 52. Yeah. And yeah, like you say, uh, considering the amount of people that can't get stuff, then that's an awful lot. I mean, we, we went down to Tabletop Nation just through the week on the, on the 4th, on May the 4th, in fact, and did the X, uh, and did the X Wing regionals. Yeah. Down there, and there was a lot of people down there. There was a, I've, I can count the number of games I've ever gone into a, a competition on one hand. Yeah. And that, that saga, but that was mainly because we were running them or helping. Yeah. You know, and X Wing and, and Dreadball, that's it. I've never been interested in, in competition play really. And X Wing has dragged me into it. Kicking and screaming and hollering and, because it's such a good game, it's, it's, mm. I had a really good time down down at the regionals. Yeah, it was didn't do very well, came eleventh or whatever. But yeah, one of the guys down um, my local club um, was winning a, a tournament down uh, down Firestone, and he won it, and he he won um, a ticket to um, Gen Con, mm. which he basically had to give away to him because he said, "I can't afford, <laughs> I yeah. can't afford to fly over to America and stay for four days playing." Yeah, I think the big thing about the nationals, as opposed to the regionals, is you get you you, you get your golden ticket in, and mm. you. I think it was the first round buy or whatever as well, but you also get paid for <laughs> yes. with, the, with the national one. So. Yeah, that's one. Yeah. yeah, if you, yes, if you're the national champion, you yeah, it's uh, it's yeah, it's an expenses trip. It's an expenses trip, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Talking of X Wing, have either you seen the foam storage that KR are doing? For seen it, got it, use it. Is it good? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I oh, mean, yeah. basically, you're looking between battle, battle foam do, and X wing kit. Yeah, um, yeah, but uh, but that's sort of specific ships, and they, the the KR one looks it's it's generic storage for the ships on the stands, and yeah, you get, you put, yeah, with the exception of the Millennium and Falcon and Slave One, yeah, yeah no, I goes mean, in, that goes in there as well. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. yeah. Uh, the difference between the two is, you, it, with, I think, I think the down, if there's any downside to the models. It's the fact that the the stands are a bit dodgy. Yeah, I mean, not the strongest, are they, really? No, no. So, to me, I just went with the KR because you didn't have to take them off the stands. Yeah, they just sit in there. As where with the with the battleform ones, you're continually taking the, mm. the, mm. the stands apart. Yeah. So, I mean, the KR one, is like because uh, I was looking at it, you kind of think, well, okay, I've got to go for the one that's got Millennium Falcon, Slave 1, and stores 20 ships. Yeah, uh, and that works out what thirty two quid including postage. I think it's something like that. I mean, how does that compare to the Battlefront one? I must. Not, I haven't looked at the Battlefront one at all. I think. I think my my yeah my KR one was without the box, just the phone. Right. Okay. Well, it was all right. I mean, it was twenty five quid or something, twenty six quid. Yeah, I just need yeah. the box. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, I'll, I'll need a box as well because I ha- you know because I haven't got the oh. system and stuff. But even, but as I say, uh, I, I was thinking thirty quid. Actually, that's yeah, I'm, I'm happy to drop on, on that system. But I, I don't know how much the Battlefoam one. My gut feel and from what I've seen of other things about Battlefoam is that Battlefoam is is put is 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 good and it's very popular, but it's also not cheap. Uh, I think the Battlefoam is more expensive. I mean, it's nice foam. I've got battle foam, other stuff, and it is really good. Mm. It's just that to me, it doesn't do the job as well, just because of the fact you have to take the yeah. the ships apart all the yeah. time. I mean, the KR one, it fits all your all your templates in and your cards and everything. I mean, I've got two starter sets plus all the other crap I've got sitting in there quite happily. It's yeah, yeah. That, that, that's why I thought it'd be useful for because it's actually it. It, it becomes a game in a nice cardboard box, or you get one of the holders as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I just happened to have one of the metal. I've got one of the the nice metal things from years ago, you know, when they first started doing them. Oh, yeah, uh, the old, that, yeah, that the is old now my. Is. Yeah, that is now my X-wing box. It's like oh, cool. 
Well, it's just, yeah, it's just so handy. It's just, and, and I mean, I throw that about <laughs> and then just think, oh, no, that's got all my, and they're the fine. They're really well protected in there. So, mm. Of course, they've just, uh, and of course, as May the 4th, they had a Star Wars Day in, in, in America. Wave 3. Uh, a lot of speculation about what was going to come out at Wave 3. I think they've basically done what most people have expected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, although, uh, what's that weird ship? Because I, I don't recognise that. Right, okay, so we've got the, uh, we've got the B-Wing. Yeah. Which, okay, we can discuss why one Earth B-Wing has got barrel roll in a minute. Uh, <laughs> since that's it, it was something It can that, spin around. <laughs> yes, that seems to be something that excites us. Yeah, but they're a heavy fighter. <laughs> well, yeah, remember when you used to fly them in um, in 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 the X Wing in the X Wing PC game? They were really slow and heavy. Okay, huge amount of armor and firepower, loads of shields, but you know they're not exactly the most maneuverable things in the world. Well, maybe because it's going from sort of vertical to horizontal. Mm. <laughs> maybe. Uh, anyway, so you got that. You got the uh, you got the tie bomber. Yep. Got to have a tie bomber. And I mean. Yep. The, the, the ship I was most stoked about, which is the mm. Lander Shuttle, despite everything else, that's probably my favourite ship in Star Wars. Because I just love the old gull wing and the wings fold out and stuff. I just, I just love that. I, I, I just really love the design of that particular model. So I was really stoked. It does look like it does look like it. The wings fold. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I've actually seen uh, a couple of shots of one with the wing folded up. Yeah. I think yeah. if it does, oh, that is just so cool. Yeah. <laughs> And then you've got this HWK290, which, yeah. if I remember rightly, I say I don't remember rightly, but I, I, I looked it up on Wikipedia. Uh, originally, it came in with um, I think it's, it came from uh, was it Dark Forces computer game? Yeah, I mean it's the extended universe. Yeah, thing. Okay. yeah, it's from Dark Forces, I think. Yeah, cause, uh, yeah, because it came out with the uh, the, um, the was it Carl Katan or whatever his name is, Carl Katan. Yeah. Uh, it was in Dark Force. It was in the Dark Forces computer game. So it's the first extended universe ship, which is interesting because I mean, loads of people uh, again, loads of people went turn and went, well, why haven't they? One, why haven't they gone back to episodes one, two, and three? And actually, the reason because they haven't gone back to that is because they haven't got the license for it. I, I believe they've only had the license for for uh, for the original and best trilogy. Uh, because there was only one trilogy. One, two, and three didn't exist. Sorry. I'm really glad they haven't gone back. Mm. Yeah, because then we'd have some annoying five-year-old in, in a starfighter shooting everything up. <laughs> just the whole clone, it just doesn't interest me. Mm. No. No. If it doesn't have Darth in it, or you <laughs> If it doesn't have Stormtroopers in, it's not a real Star Wars film. I'm sorry. Well said, sir. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> when I look at Extreme Miniatures game, Every time I see it, my my brain goes back to the hours and hours I spent playing <laughs> X-wing on the on the PC. Yeah, because I I played that game to death because I just loved it. The problem is with looking at all these ships coming out and thinking, hey, well, hang on a second, if I'm if I'm playing mission, if if I want to kind of devise missions from X-wing, you know, I need tie interceptors and bombers by the shed load. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, yeah, you just gotta play it as the game, Neil. <laughs> Don't try and do it as the computer game. Yeah, but I mean, why was I funny that? <laughs> this is why you. This is why your your son is sleeping on a box on a bed that's balancing on on a thousand cardboard boxes full of hero clips. <laughs> terrain. Oh, you've seen his bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just imagining it. <laughs> that just doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> that oh uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yes. Less is more, Lee. Less is more. Right. Yeah, yeah, but... It'll scale up, though. X-Wing will scale up. We tried it. It's good. It is Definitely good. people in. I mean, I, I, I've been obsessed, I think, because we were going to the regionals and things. We're playing the tournament scenario. Right. Which is stick the asteroids there and blow each other up. But there's so much more to the game that now all the tournament fury is over uh, because we can't get into the nationals anyway then I mean we're just looking forward to going back and making scenarios for it and playing the ones there are and yeah 
to trying out the campaign system that we've made up for it and stuff like that. So. I mean, the first thing is like, well, you know, the first thing I th- immediately I thought was when having bought the two starter sets and went out and went, oh, the Millennium Falcon is still available in Wave 2. So I bought that, and the first thing is like, hang on a second, I've got Millennium Falcon and four TIE Fighters. <laughs> Well, hey, so, okay, that's that's two scenarios. <laughs> so we've got <laughs> Escape from the Death Star, and then we've got Dodging Through the Asteroids. Superb, off we go. What more do you want? Indeed. You know, if people haven't played it, from a, from a guy who is a sceptic, it is better than Wings of War, in my opinion. A couple of guys who I've played it with who played a lot of Wings of War to and say it's much better than Wings of War. Uh, it's just got more depth, hasn't it? It's yeah. Just, yeah. Not not too much to bog it down, but just a little, yeah, you know, it's just... And it's Star Wars. It's yeah. Star Wars. What, what, yeah, it's Star Wars. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, okay, I mean, I realise to a certain extent that's talking to a certain generation, but since we are blokes of a certain age, you know... <laughs> well, Everybody likes again. Star Wars. Like my Facebook page said the other day, which I got an awful lot of stick for from an awful lot of my non-geeky friends, by the way... Uh, yeah, Star Wars is like pizza. You waiting for me to carry on? Are you? Yeah. I was. Yes. <laughs> you, you, didn't, you didn't read my Facebook. Like, Star did, Wars is. Yeah, I did. Star I, Wars is. I, I just put up. Star Wars is like pizza. Everybody loves it. Well, I say I put most people love it, even if it's a guilty pleasure. And those people that don't. Are and I actually changed that to I can't remember what else I put, but you're gonna have to think of something suitable to in, put in that spot on the on the podcast. And I got a lot of stick for it, I couldn't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't like Star Wars, does that make I said, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It does, sorry. It's like if my wife likes Star Wars, she'll just never admit to it. She still quotes it. I see it like Penny on Big Bang. It's osmosis. Yeah. She's been round she's been round geekdom <laughs> and war game stuff so long that she actually turns around and comes out with some comment about games or whatever and then sort of looks as if say, Where did that come from? <laughs> Haven't we my wife and Star Trek? <laughs> there are only so many seasons of Star Trek you can sit through before you grow to love it. Yeah, yeah, precisely. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. So I mean, I mean, everybody loves Star Wars. Everybody does. Yeah. yeah. T- talking of which, that's not the only thing that we've, we've been playing Star Wars wise recently. But, def- but def- definitely not you. I mean, there's the there's the Living Card game. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, it dragged me into it, and then the whole Fantasy Flight games. Yeah, you know, over the last year or so. Yeah. I probably played a few Fantasy Flight games. And I've never played a bad one yet. Even if I've not particularly not been interested in it to start with, mm. every one I've played is, is a jolly decent game. So, of course, add that, wouldn't I sort of... I, I think I grew through X-Wing and a few of the other games, I thought, well, they don't produce rubbish. And then there's another Star Wars thing came out, and it was a living card game. I've never played one in my life before. I hadn't been interested. I've, lots of people play Warhammer Invasion or whatever down at the club, but yeah. it, it, it's not a board game. It's not a war game. It's not interested me. You know? But it was a Star Wars living card game. I think I watched a YouTube playthrough. Yeah. Uh, my daughter offered to buy it for me oh. when, when she got a new job. So I was like, oh, okay. We'll get it, and like I say, I'd never, never, never really been interested in the living card games, and it's brilliant. <laughs> it's, it's really good fun. I'm a convert. A different take on deck building because of the uh, the way they theme the decks. It's you know, it's not um, it's not like Magic where you grab individual cards. Well, or even like something like Lord of the Rings, for example. Lord of the Rings, you you you, you deck build with individual cards. Star Wars 1 is very much a case if you take several sets and each set follows a theme. Just little touches like that. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's just really cool and the artwork's lovely and it's really well produced. It is one of these things of you look at what you get, the, the amount of bang for your buck you get with, with Fantasy Flight games. I mean, okay, they're a big company, so, you know, they can afford to 
get you know discounts on stuff on on what they produce for the amount of quantity they produce but you look at what they produce and it is superb quality isn't it it does put a lot of other companies to shame i think mm. Mm. I, I mean there's one thing i, I mean I, I was asked to review uh I, I was asked to review a particular game and it was it was okay it was a battle card game and it was put, it didn't float my boat but the thing was at the same time as as that i just bought elder sign which is the uh, which is effectively call of cthulhu the dice game and you got this this game that uh, was re- retailing for 15 quid which basically consisted of 72 cards and a paper play sheet and then you've got something which i just bought and that's a that retail 15 quid you've got something which i just bought for like 20 pounds or 22 pounds i think it was and it's got hundreds of cards custom artwork etched uh, custom etched yeah. dice quality wise it's just too chalk and cheese and you think uh, i mean you know i don't know how they do it well i mean you well, do know how they do it as you say you know big big corporation and, and you know they can afford to, you know they can afford to buy the bulk to actually get it sorted but they do consistently produce quality stuff yeah i mean I, uh, I it's just, just sorry go on. i was just gonna i've been really impressed with the stuff in x-wing just the card stock in it it's wonderful stuff yeah just everything you can't fold you can't fold the packaging there's nothing you can fold I don't think, and, and the artwork. I mean, I mean, the other fancy fight stuff I've, I've had yet, like the the Space Hulk card game and yeah. things. Yeah, it's all been. No matter what I thought of the subject matter, I've just picked up. Oh, that's nice. It's just like don't know anything about this, but it's nice. The the living card game, the Star Wars one, was the same. As soon as I opened it, it was like I spent as much time just drooling over the components, really. Even the punch cut, you know, the punch bits seem to be easier to get out and, and nicer and better finished. You know, it's like, and the gameplay is, I don't think I've ever played any of their games yet where the gameplay hasn't been very smooth. I must admit, I think the first, uh, I think gameplay on, funny enough, you mentioned, um, Space Hot Car game that they produce, uh, De- Death Angel, that's it, Death Angel. Yeah, Death Angel. Uh, that's it. When that first came out, it wasn't until they actually got an FAQ out and sorted it and um, I went, okay, right, well, this is how this is how this works because that's one of the uh, it's actually one of the few rule books that you actually went through the rules and kind of went what <laughs> and and there have been a couple of that that you know just on uh, on on a couple of their games there have been things where the rule books haven't been fantastic for whatever reason. Oh really? I don't know. Having maybe said just, having said that, maybe I just read rules and yeah. But again, yeah, but, uh, <laughs> but fill in the gaps and play it wrong. Obviously. Exactly. But uh, having said that, what they do do at the same time, their customer service is great. In the case of if they, you know, if they find an issue, they'll go back and fix it, and they'll normally make it and they'll normally make it available for free as soon as possible. I mean, they had a th- uh, they had an issue with because they do uh, Mansions of Madness, which is a Call of Cthulhu miniatures game. Yeah, and uh, they found a produ- uh, uh, they had a production problem, and so you know as, as soon as they discovered they had a production problem, they they stopped distribution of that particular expansion, you know, and and basically did bent over backwards to ensure that the people who'd already bought the expansion got the corrected components and, and bits and pieces as soon as possible, which, and then made sure that it didn't go back on sale until everything had been sorted and corrected. Hats off to them, and probably one of the main reasons why I'm going to the UK Games Expo this year is because it's a first year fancy flight of there, and you know just to kind of go and drool over their stand. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but uh, if petrol was cheaper, I'd be there just to do the same. Yes, yeah, I mean, yeah, let's I say the, the added advantage is that you know of all the shows. Okay, Games Expo is probably the closest for me, so uh, yeah, it, it just classes my local. So, uh, so that is the one. Th- so that is the other reason why I'm going. But uh, uh, yeah, a good day out, all the same. But uh, but of course, uh, other than the Star Wars Living Card Game, that wasn't the only thing that you had waiting for you on Star Wars Day at all, was it? Was oh, it- yeah, yeah, I've sort of <laughs> even upped my Star Wars geekness completely. I think. I mean, uh, you've got an RPG on this, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, I've always been 
I grew up playing RPGs. Yeah, mm. just from the very first, even before uh, D and D edition one, we were playing D and D from before it was even a real game. Is that in the little uh, A5 white box? Yeah, well, it wasn't yeah. even a box we got. It was like an A5 little uh, booklet that somebody's dad bought back from mm. the States uh, from some dodgy shop because he was a Lord of the Rings freak that we started playing. It'll never catch had... on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just like, uh, just trying to, yeah, getting a 20-sided dice was a nightmare. <laughs> you have to you whittle to your of, own. You have to make your own. <laughs> Yeah. No, but well, yeah. I mean, you you actually had to put the there was no there was no twenty sided dice. I mean, there's twenty sided dice, but they were percentage dice. Yeah, yeah, they were they not nothing had a, a a one to twenty on it. You had to get a hot pin and put a dot in the in the right one to make it a, an eighteen rather than an eight. Anyway, I digress. So when I was yeah, when I was little, you had to. Uh... We had to make our own dice. <laughs> to make our own dice. To make our own figures. <laughs> coal? Coal? Bloody luxury. We had to kill somebody and skin them and use bone. <laughs> oh, anyway. <sir. laughs> it's getting late, you can tell. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is getting late. It's hunger setting in, hunger setting. Yeah, yeah so we... we yeah, I've always played role-play games, but then sort of went off them. Uh, or just went away from them and, and did normal gaming and stuff. And then by the time I came back into it, it was all D20, all the same game, but with different themes and, and just hated the whole system from then. But um, it, it caught my eye because it was Star Wars, because it was Fancy Flight mm. and because it had funky dice. Yeah, so we, we started, we, we've got the beginner's game. And Which is Edge, been, of, Edge of Empire? Edge of, the Edge Empire? of Empire, yeah, yeah. yeah. Is it any good? It's brilliant. It is really good. It, so what do you get to I do mean, in it then? Cool. Sorry? What do you get to do in it? What, you want spoilers on the uh, scenario? <laughs> 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 you want me to spoil the playthrough scenario? Mm, uh, mm, mm, Can you play Stormtrooper? <laughs> well, I, th- I think I think what the idea is, I mean, they, they brought out the beta version of the full roleplay game. Yeah. And they, they've been working on that, which was supposed to be out by now, but for some reason isn't, but I'm not quite sure why. Uh, but they also were running or, or planning to produce the the beginner's set, which is, is out. That, that's the one you can buy. Right. And it, it, it's the role-playing game, but it's only got the bits in that you need to run through the beginner's scenario. And it is, for what it is, it's superbly done. That anybody could pick up this and it's designed to go through and you learn it as you, you're playing. Yeah. Now, to an experienced lot of, of role players like we were down at the club, you would think that it's going to be fairly limited. You know, that you don't need, we don't need to know a lot of the stuff that they're saying. You already know how it's sort of, how it's going to flow and work. But if you didn't, then, you just basically read. It's scripted. The dungeon, the the games master bit is just scripted out for you. It tells you what to tell the players, uh, and the way they've designed it, it adds a little bit more each uh, scene that they do, each episode that they do. Right. Um, uh, and the the whole beginner scenario is is the four players uh, escaping, and they've got they they escape and eventually sort of nick a. a f- Falcon, basically, and 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 go off into the into the skies and get attacked by ties. But it teaches you the game as you're going along. Yeah. And the big thing it has to teach you is is the dice system, and that's why it was even useful for us as a club. I mean, I only wanted to, to take four players through it the other night, but then everybody wanted in, so we downloaded the other two characters and ended up. I mean, six people playing and me running it. And nobody had played the, the die system. So we were all learning it as we went, we went along. And it, and it worked, it worked well for that. You know, it just adds stuff as you're going along. Yeah. But uh, the, the thing that makes it is the, is the die system. There, there's no, they're all shaped dice, like we're all used to, multi-sided dice. But there's no numbers on there. They're, they're full of symbols. 
There is not a one to twenty to be thrown. Um, oh right, oh, right. So they're all like custom, they're all like custom etched dice, sort of thing. Yeah, all custom etched dice. Uh, the X wing dice. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're all the same. They're, they're exactly, you know, they're the same quality as those. But there's a six sider. There's a eight twelve. Uh, well, there's, there's eight twelves. No ten sider. Uh, no, there's no twenty. The the twelves and eights, by the looks of it, and a six. Yeah, six twelve, uh, six, six eight and twelves. Oh right. No tens. But and they're different colours, and they've got different symbols on. So you've got an ability dice, you've got a proficiency dice, which are the the positive dices, and a boost dice, which are the positive dices. Then you've got a difficulty dice, a challenge dice, a setback dice, which are the the bad dice. Mm. And then you've got a force dice that you at the, in the beginners game you only use that at the beginning just to to get your force points, your destiny points. But the whole idea is you build up a, a pool of dice that you then throw for that wherever you're testing for. Yeah. And even if it's an opposed test, you only throw one pool of dice because you get the the active player will get a, a a pool of dice based on their ability and proficiency. So you might get three green dice and one of those might be upgraded to a yellow dice. So you've got an eight and a twelve die right. sided dice, a green and a yellow one. And then the the games master will put in a difficulty dice or two, depending if it's an easy thing you get one put in, if it's a if it's a uh, an average sort of skill check, you'll get two purple dice, two difficulty dice put in. They might get upgraded for situations. If it's an opposed roll against a character, they'll be put in there, you know, two purple and a red dice in, which is, is the challenge dice. And you roll them as a pool. Right. And the symbols on it, basically you're looking for successes or failures. And if the net result of all the dice is one success or more, then it's passed. If it's one failure or more, then it's failed. But within that, there's also uh, a try, what they call uh, advantage symbols and uh, a threat symbol. And if you get more advantages than threats, then something has gone your way. And it, it's it's very hard to, to explain yeah. without mm. actually showing. But it results in the fact that you can fail a test, you can fail a, a test, but have more advantages than than threats. So, mm. so, so for instance, if you were trying to bluff your way past or bluff your way in through a security drawer or bounce on the door of a canteen or, or whatever it may be. Yeah. You can effectively fail, but you could have a couple of advantages, which would mean he would say, no, you're not coming in. He's not going to let you in, but he's not going to beat you up. Right. Or if you were trying to bribe somebody for something, they might, you might not bribe them, but they're not going to turn around and call for the nearest stormtrooper. And all of a sudden, it's got a lot more depth and narrative in it by just the dice rolling. Uh, I've, I've simplified it a lot there, but I mean that's 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 basically the system. And nobody had played anything like it before. Although I think it's I think there's a dungeon, there's a fancy flight dungeon crawling game that that might use the same sort of dice system. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, oh um, is it based on, uh, was it Descent? I don't know if it's Descent or whether, yeah, it, it, it's a similar the, uh, as Descent, but I think there's a role-playing one that that, that uses almost as, I'm not, I'm not oh, sure. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, but quite a few people that, that just came in on the, the game that I took them through were a bit sceptic, I think. Yeah. But it, it, it works really well. It, and it, it adds a narrative without, without even trying. Yeah. It's, uh, instead of like, oh, I'm, I'm throwing a D20, I know I need 18, modify that up and down, you either pass or you fail, the closer you get to 20, 
the better you've done it. Yeah. Mm. All of a sudden, you can pass really well. You, you can you can pass the skill check really well, which means you've you've done the task really well. But all of a sudden, you've got more threats than you have advantages. So something's gone wrong. Got you. Yeah. yeah sounds interesting. So uh, yeah, yes. those droids you're looking for. Those are the droids you're looking for. You yeah. splice you splice the computer terminal and got the information you you wanted out perfectly. But the threat you a click behind the you. threat dice, yeah, is <laughs> a click behind you. Or it's fused the main box and a bit, a bit like Mike's work. It's all gone yeah, all of a sudden all the computers decide <laughs> that they don't like him anymore. Yeah. And it, it just adds and combat's the same, you know, you're looking for the the more successes you get, the the more damage the person takes. You soak up some of the damage, then it goes to onto your wounds and things. It just all it it just all works really well without even talking a number all night. And I think everybody that played, even I mean they are die hard RPGs, some of them. And I might have <laughs> die hard uh Star Wars RPGs that use Saga, the D20 Saga system. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they and they were quite sceptical that it wasn't going to be as good. Hmm. Yeah, everybody's waiting for next week so we can carry on. Oh, superb. With, with hmm. the downloaded uh, R, yeah, uh, Jabba the Hutt type scenario that you can download. It, Result? If it, was a be- if it was a beginner and you wanted to... to take people through learning how to role play it would be the best thing since sliced bread as a any experienced role player that loves star wars and has never played the the dice system before then i think the beginning the beginner's box is really good to take you through how it all works because it it explains what the threat should actually be and what you can do with them and yeah uh, if you can add boost dice, a very quick example would be that if you if you're shooting at somebody, you roll your dice, blah blah blah. If you get more advantages than than, than threats, then you can add a boost dice onto the next attack that goes onto that person too. So as well as any damage they might take, they might just soak up the damage, or you might just do one damage. Normally that wouldn't do a thing. Yeah. The player can say, right, I'm going to use my advantages to put this boost dice onto the character. So the next time somebody attacks them, they add a boost dice, which is a good dice, in, into their role. And the idea would be that they justify that. OK, the character's reeling back. You've not hurt him, but he's reeled back and hit a, you know, stumbled into a chair and he's now off balance. Yeah. So the next person that hits him is going to get an advantage on that. So, And you can't do that with just rolling a d20. <laughs> so it just everybody was really quite very so good then with how it worked. Sorry. So it it's a good game. Is it a good a good intro into uh? Yeah, it'd be a good intro. It would introduce any even hardened players into the the, the dice system. Mm. Mm. And I think if you already knew the dice system, which you probably won't because you've never played it before, because uh, it's a new game, or yeah, and you were a very experienced role player, then you could probably dive into the into the big book when it comes out. But if you never played an RPG before? If you never played an RPG, it's perfect. If you've dabbled in RPGs, but it's all been the D20 system, then you it would really help to run through this to get used to the to the dice mechanic. If you're a really experienced role player and you want to get into the, the full Edge of Empire game when it comes out, then I still think it's worth a 20-whatever quid for the components you get in it, the extra dice set you, you get in it, and uh, the fact that that it's a good introduction for people to the dice system itself. Yeah. And it's like X-Wing. You get the dice, but you don't get enough. Yeah. So you're really going to have to buy... If, you, if you've got four or five people playing, you'll need a few sets of oh, dice. Is, uh, oh, OK. I, I, I now get why... They do a dice app... Yeah, we're, or you get the dice app, which everybody, although we'd never played the game before, everybody that sat on the table, bar two people, had the dice app. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and used it. And I was really like, no, really, guys, just throw the bloody dice, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 
in the end, even I was using mine. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> which is a whole nother episode by itself, really, isn't it? Indeed. D- dice apps. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we'll talk. Yeah, I don't think we'll talk for over two hours on dice apps, though. Mind you, oh, I suppose we could give it a go. <laughs> Once we started ranting about them. Oh yes, uh, yeah, they're rubbish, you know. Yeah. <laughs> they're weighted. <laughs> they're weighted. <laughs> weighted dice apps. Uh, I was, ve- I, I was, I was very, tem- I was very tempted. To- I've got through three phones throwing at the wall. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and on that joke, I think we need to finish. <laughs> yep. <laughs> oh dear me, mate. joke. Joke. Oh, okay. Nice <laughs> uh, <clears throat> cool, actually. It's got proper dice on it as well, so you could use it for everything, and it makes Darth Vader sounds. Oh, does it? Hmm. Has it got the X-wing dice on it? It's got the X-wing yeah. dice. It's got the yeah. It's got it's got everything on it. It's got normal dice. It's got the X-wing dice. It's got the role play dice. Oh, am I going to buy that? And it makes stuff. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's about three. What you can choose. There's, there's four or five different sound uh, kits in there. Oh, I'm have, oh no, I'm have to go go and buy that now. Mm. Yeah, you got to. Yeah, you got to. It's it's good. Well, it has to be said the other week, uh, uh, Amazon Kindle free app of the day was um, "Hey, That's My Fish," which was uh, um, which I mean it's a brilliant board game, but but they produced an app version of it, which is absolutely wonderful. So if ever that yeah, if ever you get a chance to play Fantasy Flight, "Hey, That's My Fish," and actually their Elder Sign app as well. Again, that's only, that's only, that's only, about, that's only about three three quid or so. That's brilliant. On um, uh, 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 that's brilliant on Kindle. So, even down to apps that they've been producing for various stuff, you know, fancy flight, high quality stuff. And it seems a good, it seems like a good place to finish. The Mickles and Mixes podcast is very happy to be sponsored by Coat Dance Paints. Now, Coat Arms have been supporting miniatures painters with their products for well over 20 years in some way, shape or form. Their current range is 150 sets of acrylic paint, which are available both as individual colours, but also in paint sets depending on period. Things such as the Ancients paint set, the World War II German, World War II American, World War II Russian paint sets... And they also include things like an ACW set and even a horse town set. That's one way to purchase your paints. And they also do triads. Now, if you're a fan of the three colour system made famous by the likes of people like Kevin Dallimore, you may like to purchase your paints with a dark shade, a medium shade and a highlight. And the triad system from Coat d'Arms allows you to do this. They also have ranges of textured paints called Brushscape, which allow you to paint from the textures onto bases as well as colour. And these are ideal especially for smaller scale models. And if you're a fan of the dip method of painting, then Coat d'Arms have their own product available called Super Shader. This is available in light brown, dark brown and black. Coat d'Arms paints have a whole range of products available to try. Check them out at www.blackhat.co.uk and be sure to tell them that we sent you. So obviously you've just heard that chat between uh, myself, Mike and Rich and there are uh, a few things I'd like to cover uh, issues that we raised in the show which um, things may have changed First off, the, uh, the big thing obviously to address uh, to do with X-Wing is the fact that uh, Wave 1 is now in the country uh, it came in the country during the first week of June I happened to mention during our chat that getting hold of Wave 1 ships was a little, little bit like getting hold of uh, Walking Horse, what's it? Um, that, of, of, well, for the moment, has now changed. Uh, we've also got a release date for Wave 3, which is August the 1st. So, uh, all the Wave 3 goodness coming on August the 1st. And I suspect 
there's going to be an almighty rush uh, to get sh- ships from Wave Three. You know, knowing what happened with Wave One and you know to a lesser extent with Wave Two. Uh, for example, now we're in a situation where we can't get hold of Wave Two ships. Uh, I am kicking myself for not buying a second A wing. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, obviously, uh, wait, with Wave Three coming up on August the first, um, I can see uh, you know, some big orders going in. I know I want you know things like maybe a couple of three shuttles, uh, definitely three t- three tie bombers, a couple of B wings, that sort of thing. Now, one thing which um, I don't think we really talked about much during our discussion of X-Wing and something that I'm really keen to do. Obviously X-Wing seems to be set up primarily for uh, competition gaming. Uh, Sorry, or tournament gaming. You know, it's a set up number of points, uh, fly missions and away you go. One of the things that really excites me about Star Wars Space Combat and uh, I think this comes back I can't remember if I mentioned it now but it comes back to in my late teens uh, playing the Star Wars X-Wing games on PC they are uh, one of my uh, top three computer games that uh, that I've ever played um I know in you know in these grand days of uh, massive graph you know massively wonderful graphics and, and what have you, uh, this may seem quite quaint, but uh, I let you know yeah from from a gameplay point of view, my three favourite games of all time are XCOM uh, that's the original XCOM not the uh, the recently re released one, uh, X Wing, and Elite, uh, which I suppose dates me as a computer gamer but there you go but from the X-Wing point of view then one thing I am looking at is uh, all the missions and wondering just how many of those missions that I flew on the computer game will now translate onto the board game obviously there are certain balance issues I mean the one thing with the computer game is that you are destroying hordes and hordes of TIE fighters and TIE bombers and what have you. You know, it's wave after wave after wave. And the miniatures game is balanced slightly differently. Also, uh, I seem to find, uh, uh, especially as you go through all the mission logs, you find yourself uh, engaging an awful lot of, well, ships that aren't, uh, aren't available yet. Uh, especially things like uh, freighters, stormtrooper shuttles, and uh, assault gunboats. And then, obviously, the other th- the other big thing that we tended to engage a lot of uh, were frigates. And, you know, I think uh, it's already been shown that if you put a frigate onto uh, an X-Wing table, it would fill it. <laughs> I think I've seen a couple of uh, a couple of scale models to the X-wing scale. Uh, was it one to two eighty fifth or whatever it is uh, of a frigate, and they are fairly huge. So you've got to try and be a bit discerning on that. But it's one reason why, for example, I'd, I'd like you know several shuttles. There's a classic mission that involves uh, five shuttles, uh, which is the rescue of Admiral Akbar. Now, that's the one where you've got, uh, in, in the computer game, there are five shuttles ahead of you. You have to fly through them, identify which one has the prisoners, and disable it. And then uh, wait for uh, a ship to come and dock and uh, take them away, all the while fending off the Imperials. That sort of mission um, is the sort of thing I'm interested in. Things like... Um, protecting uh, ships from incoming um, enemy raiders. For example, you've got a rebel ship that is undergoing repairs, an Imperial frigate warps in and stops uh, attacking the rebel ship, uh, dropping TIE bombers uh, with escorting fighters and stuff to try and take the the ship out before it can be repaired and uh, hyperspace out of the area. You have to, you know, effectively you're on cap. You know, you have to protect the ship. 
that sort of mission is the sort of thing that, again, I'd like to put together in X-Wing. Now, there are, uh, on the web, uh, a couple of places where you can get hold of uh, details of all the missions from X-Wing and all uh, its subsequent games. So, that includes things like Imperial Pursuit, B-Wing, stuff like that. And that takes you right from, I believe, the... um, the start of the hunt for the Death Star right through uh, to Hoth. Okay, so Quarum is quite a, quite a, a decent time in the, in the Rebellion and there are a lot of missions. Uh, I think we're talking somewhere in the region of ooh, 40 or 50, uh, probably even more at the last count. So within that framework, there should be several that we can that, that I should be able to find that I can convert to uh, the X-Wing miniatures game so that's one thing I'm kind of looking to do in the background and uh, you know we'll see you know we'll see where we go Uh, obviously as I said there's there's perhaps going to be a few balance issues uh, a few things to look into so that covers X-Wing I realised having talked about Star Wars the card game we didn't really explain an awful lot about the game itself you know we talked a lot about the, uh, the artwork and what have you uh, didn't talk a lot about the game itself. I've been playing uh, several games of this particular card game since then. I was quite surprised when I looked it up on the web that uh, it had a, a very mixed reaction uh, amongst uh, gamers. Uh, a lot of negative reaction I was quite surprised to, uh, uh, to find. As we talked uh, in the main part of the show, you know, it's Star Wars. The cards are fabulous. So it will appeal to um, a particular generation. Um, it, you know, it's aimed at a particular audience. Not necessarily the card playing audience, which is one reason why, for example, deck building works the way it does. You know, where you you don't build with individual cards, but you build with sets. Uh, you have one objective card. Each objective has uh, six cards, which are like um, activation cards, uh, unit cards, that sort of thing, which are then used in your main deck during the game. You know, that is a a bit of a divergence for the looming card games. Uh, Something new. The other thing which uh, I find interesting, and uh, something in playing it, uh, myself and Dave have come across a lot, and that is actually balance. Is the gaming experience the same? Is it an even chance of winning for the Empire than it is for the Rebellion? There is no note in the game itself to say that the Re- the Rebels or the Empire are easier or harder to play. You know, it does have to be noted that you know, the the Rebels are always heading for defeat unless they can beat the Empire. Uh, you know, the timer of the game is effectively the the Death Star being constructed and uh, when the Death Star is constructed uh, the Rebels lose the game now if you look on the tournament rules Star Wars the card game you'll find that when Fantasy Flight have been running tournaments they've been doing it so both players play with both a light side deck and a dark side deck, and you play both ways round. Okay, so you play as the light side, and you play as the dark side, and you do an aggregate score. Whoever wins the aggregate score, wins that round. That, to me, would seem to indicate that the game is not balanced. That actually, it seems the dark side has more chance of winning the game than the light side does. Thematically, I don't have a problem with that. don't have a problem at all. However, if you're playing the game, if you buy the game, I think that is something you need to be potentially be aware of. So if you are playing the game, I would suggest that you play using the tournament conditions. Just don't use the time frame. Because a tournament time frame for a game is 80 minutes. Um, I don't think I've played a game in under 80 minutes yet. And that's supposed to get two games in. 
and maybe I'm just being slow at this point in time. But I would certainly suggest that you do what uh, they do in tournaments and you play an aggregate. So you choose a light side deck, you choose a dark side deck and you play both ways around. And then you aggregate and whoever wins uh, with the aggregate of uh, points and what the Death Star dial got to and that sort of thing, that is who wins the game. Because of this balance issue and I, you know, I am open to being completely wrong you know I am open to being told that I am completely out of order and this is wrong uh, but because of this you know this is something that you know I think you need, you need to be a bit more aware of uh, maybe I've just missed it maybe I have just missed uh, where Fantasy Flight have put out and go hey you know this is the way the game is actually designed but that's certainly what we appear to have discovered whilst playing the game as for the RPG, well, I, we should be able to tell you a lot more about that um, in the next few weeks. Since we recorded that show, we've uh, gone a bit further, and Rich has actually set up the fact that we're going to play this. Now, rather interestingly, we're going to do it over Skype. We're going to play a role-playing session with guys from all over the country. Okay, all role-playing via Skype. It's going to be really interesting to see how that works out. But, you know, I'll report back on uh, this particular session that we're going to do. Uh, it's the first time I've done a role-playing session for ooh, several years. So it'll be interesting to see just what the whole thing is like. As I say, I'll let you know. You know, role-playing, obviously, uh, something that's normally a bit out of scope for this particular show. In this particular instance, you know, I think it's uh, of sufficient interest to to, uh, to various people to actually do something with it. Okay, so that's all the Star Warsy stuff I want to cover. Uh, let's just talk about another couple of bits and pieces just before I go. Okay, first off, uh, a couple of thank yous. Uh, thank you to uh, Peter West and Colin Pig, uh, both for uh, donating towards the show. Really appreciate. Uh, your gifts guys thank you very much you know, for, your, for, your, for your generosity in helping to cover things like advertising costs and, and, uh, and funding costs and, and various other bits and pieces uh, really appreciate that uh, thank you for your continued support and if you want to support the show if you've listened to it and you feel you, know, you want to uh, uh, support the show in any way then there is a donations page uh, on the website just follow the instructions from there let's talk about a couple of events finally before I go first off UK Games Expo uh, managed to get a co- cost to this for the Saturday of the show uh, brand new venue at the NEC Metropole uh, as opposed to the old uh, venue in the, in the middle of Birmingham I would potentially suggest this is easier to get to uh, simply because uh, the NEC is at the junction of uh, two major motorways. Uh, obviously, it's got its own train station. It's close to the airport, even, which makes it uh, a, a truly international event, if you like. Obviously, as well, being held in a, a hotel, um, as opposed to its previous kind of you know, conference hall venue, it does have much more of uh, an American con feel about it or at least that's what I'm told uh, I was talking to uh, a few guys on the day um, especially um, people like uh, Dave at Hawk War Games who's been over to Temple Con for example in the States and he was saying that actually it now has that sort of US gaming convention feel to it because it's held in this big hotel there was a lot more space as far as gaming was concerned although to a certain extent it didn't feel like it it wasn't until you kind of took a step backwards and looked in the two rooms that the event was being held in and kind of think well actually these are probably both double the size of the venue that we had previously there was a bit of an issue I think with signposting I mean some people said yeah they found everything I must admit I didn't for example I was wandering around looking for the dead zone demo and never found it 
it was obviously just in a room I hadn't looked in. But there were bits and pieces happening all over the place. Okay, it's like wander around, wander down the corridor, come towards the swimming pool, and discover there's uh, yeah, a massive version of Castle Panic that has been set up. I mean, Castle Panic looked to be a great game when I saw it on tabletop. Didn't manage to get to play this one, but you know, great idea. And this is where you find things like a lot of the miniatures uh, guys who are doing demo games and stuff uh, tucked away in corners in various parts of the hotel, not in the main two. Uh, showrooms apparently people were saying there were issues with trying to get places to game especially during the day on Saturday and I'm sure that the guys at the UK Expo are going to be working with the NEC to kind of resolve that sort of issue some of the biggest complaints were to do with the price of food and uh, refreshments the only thing I would suggest and say to that is that it's a hotel. Uh, it's a big hotel near an airport. So I wasn't shocked. But then again, you know, I do a lot of travelling with work, staying away from time to time, so hotel prices don't tend to surprise me much anymore. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things. And you either accept it or you just don't bother. A couple of tips that are interesting. I mean, the uh, there was a free car park available, which filled up moderately quickly. Uh, car parking elsewhere on the NEC was quite expensive. Uh, so... The advice is get there early, I suppose. But at least they did arrange free car parking and it was within about a five minutes walk of the hotel. That, I thought in itself, was pretty good. I think the number of people attending, uh, they actually reckon the attendance overall was probably up by something like 40%. Uh, I think it just shows uh, what an impact and change uh, moving venue may well have had to the event. I think it can only get bigger and better from this point. Generally, I thought the show was really good. Um, there were, I think, a few issues. Um, it got very hot, but, you know, it's one of those things. The one thing that struck me, and uh, it struck both myself and Dave Luff, who went with us, and this is perhaps not uh, necessarily... well. Maybe it's just a feature because we play a lot of games and we play a lot of new games. But as we wandered round, we didn't see an awful lot of stuff that was particularly new to us. There's an awful lot of stuff that we were playing already. Okay, you know, th there were a few new games there. For example, it was the first time Forbidden Desert uh, appeared. And getting trying to get hold of, of a demo game of Forbidden Desert was um, problematic. And I never managed it. We did play some new games I very much liked Escape from Queen Games it's a cooperative dice rolling game which happens in real time so a game lasts 10 minutes that is uh, just uh, you know really really clever because it's Queen Games it is perhaps slightly overpriced but the components are really nice as I say it's one of these things that as a quick filler, because it is a timed game, uh, apparently uh, when you play the game with the box, it comes with the CD soundtrack. You play the CD when the soundtrack finishes, and that's the end of the game. It doesn't really work in a gaming convention. But as I say, that was a cracking game. My favourite game of the show, however, was... Uh, <clears throat> uh, a fun game which which we suggested would be um, probably one of the ideal um, after club uh, after club night games that you play down the pub. Okay, it's a game called a uh, luchador, uh, which is which is Mexican wrestling, but it's a dice game. Okay, so you know all the old Nacho Libre sort of Mexican wrestling played. On a small board, which is actually the wrestling ring, custom etched dice. You can either play it as a two-player game or as a four-player tag team. 
and it is just massive amounts of fun. Again, very quick game, filler game, probably lasts no more than about 20-30 minutes. Uh, probably nearer 20 to be honest. It, it all depends on how fast you roll your dice and that's how much fun you're having in the meantime. For me, that was the game of the show. It's not out yet. I believe that they're, they're going to be launching it via the Kickstarter. And I would certainly recommend that you keep your eyes open for it. It's a fantastic game. Really is good. So, overall, I think uh, the move of venue for the UK Games Expo has, has worked really well. Um, I think it is a far better show. It does have its issues, uh, which I'm sure it'll address. But it's the first time I've actually been to it and kind of went, I really wish I was stopping overnight. I really wish I was stopping for the weekend. A piece of advice, and it's what, what a lot of people did, because it's held in the NEC Metropole, uh, that's quite an expensive hotel. If your budget doesn't stretch that far, there's a Premier Inn just around the corner uh, with rooms that are a third of the price. And obviously, because you just kind of wander in, book into the Premier Inn, and then spend the day around the corner, you can game around the uh, you can game in, in the convention uh, for as long as you like, and you can still get back to the Premier Inn and uh, grab your room and, 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 and what have you. That is perhaps the way to do it if you want a bit of a game. If you want a bit of a budget, however, I would highly recommend this show to you next year. Uh, I know it's not just a miniatures game; it is primarily a board game, uh, a board game uh, show. Although there are a lot of, uh, especially mini tournaments going on. You know, whether it was Flames of War, War Machine, 40k, X Wing. Um, I think there was. Oh, a few other bits and pieces going on as well. But there are a lot of miniatures tournaments going on. Not so many guys there selling miniatures. Lots of board games. Lots of RPG stuff. Uh, Really just cover the full width of the gaming spectrum. And it is still one of my favourite shows of the year. Okay, let's... Uh, finally move forward to something that happened ooh, as I record this last weekend okay which is uh, well which was Operation Market Laden. now you may remember uh, a few shows ago I was talking about Chain of Command along with my cops and uh, we spent a couple of shows talking somewhat in depth about Chain of Command uh, which is the new World War II skirmish game from Two Fat Lodges, uh, coming out very soon. Now, Rich and uh, Nick, when we recorded the interview, were talking about the fact that they were kind of effect- effectively t- taking it on tour. One of those days happened to be Operation Market Laden, uh, an event which was organised by the Woven War Gamers. Uh, so, hello to you guys, especially uh, Paul Baldwin and A Deacon. Uh, thank you very much, especially to Aid, for originally thinking to invite me. It was a day's gaming uh, around all things to do with Two Fat Lardies. Okay, so, Rich came along and was running demos of Chain of Command all day. Uh, then we had games of um, I Have Been Shopman, uh, Dux Petoniarum, Shop Practice, uh, which I indulged in. Uh, thanks, Paul, for showing me and reminding me of just what a good game Shot Practice is. I haven't played Shot Practice for a long time, and uh, really enjoyed that. Uh, looks like that's now on our list of uh, games to get into. There was uh, a, no- uh, a game of Through the Mud and the Blood, but based in the Russo-Japanese Jap- War. And then there were some games that are currently under, de- under development. Uh, there was a game called Tin Star, which is a, obviously a, from the name, a, a cowboy game. There was a, a diesel punk uh, combat game being devised by Nick Hawkins and also uh, a more modern variant of I Ain't Been Shot Mum called I Ain't Been Nuked Mum okay, which I was hoping to get to play it just you know, didn't have time to do it during the day. Fantastic day of gaming. Uh, really good fun. Great to meet up with loads of different people. Uh, guys who listen to the show, uh, guys who I've come across on the Two Fat Lardies forums, where I tend to lurk, I don't tend to get involved an awful lot, but I do lurk a lot. And it was not only of gaming, but of, uh, you know, when gamers get together and you kind of go, oh, 
well, how do you do this? And how do you make that terrain? And um, how do you base those figures again? All those sort of questions going on, uh, seeing how people store their miniatures and stuff like that. So there's all that stuff going on in the background. So thanks to Ray Deacon for um, just costing me a lot of money this week in uh, uh, going out to buy new stuff to make um, hedges uh, for 15 mil. Came up with a brilliant way of doing that. And so uh, I'm going to follow his example and hopefully you'll see some, uh, you know, the results of that on the blog. And of course, it was all rounded off at the end of uh, a full day's gaming uh, with a trip to, a, to, to the Curry ha- or one of the local Curry houses in Evesham. As I promised, uh, what happens in the Curry house stays in the Curry house. <laughs> so any of the guys listening, don't worry. Uh, I won't be divulging anything that went on. I'll just say, uh, yeah, um, go out with Two Fat Lodies and uh, Two Fat Lodies fans and you know, bloke of you know, group of war gamers. Well, I think at your peril is probably being a little harsh. <laughs> Suffice it to say, we had a good time, but things were getting quite loud towards the end of the evening. <laughs> But no, that was a really good day. Wyvern War Gamers uh, have a fantastic location um, in uh, Bishampton, uh, which they use uh, every other—I think it's every other week—and then they do some full gaming days. They've been running a couple of things like they've run a couple of a couple of soccer tournaments in the past uh, and what have you. And uh, uh, it's a fantastic venue they're uh, a very welcoming bunch of guys and i just want to say thank you for a a really good day Uh, it was worth uh, (laughs) losing the brownie points for not getting back home until gone 11 o'clock at night (laughs) shall we say um but i say you thanks guys for uh, a fantastic day gaming uh it's great just to kind of uh Go for a day. You think, okay, yeah, I'd like to try this system. I, I, you know, I don't know anything much about this system. I'd like to try it and be able to do so with guys who normally play the systems and uh, you know find out how you've been playing wrong and then kind of go from there. But it's a brilliant day, and thank you to everybody for uh, your hard work and organisation. Now, finally, just before I go, uh, one thing to mention. One great thing that Two Fat Lodges did, I think, for Chain of Command was to produce a whole load of gameplay videos. There are six available on YouTube. Uh, they also have three for shot practice. Now, uh, again, as I've recorded, they have just released their first gameplay video for Ducks with Tony Armand. It's a 15-minute show giving the basic introduction and overview of the game. First of uh, a few... And they are really well worth looking at. Ducks is a, a great game. It's a a nice companion piece if you play Saga. Uh, if you know, it, you'll essentially have a lot of similar figures that you'll need between Ducks and uh, Saga, and especially you know since uh, the law room is abounding, that at some point Saga will be producing an Age of Arthur expansion. So things double up, and you can use your figures across both systems grab a look at the video it's really cool and uh, it will get you into a very very good game I'd highly recommend Ducks and uh, as I say we are waiting with bated breath uh, for the new expansion uh, which Rich mentioned apparently we're uh, they're waiting for artwork to finish on that one uh, but that should be with us fairly soon ok well Oh, that's enough of me waffling on. Uh, so, just want to say thank you very much for listening. I hope to get the next show, show to you uh, sometime in the next 10 days or so. Last few weeks have just been completely manic with one thing and another. Uh, so, the next show is probably going to be uh, myself and Mike talking about all things to do with All Quiet on the Martian Front. I'm talking about our impressions of uh, what that is looking at the gameplay and various other bits and pieces. I know that's for a Kickstarter. The Kickstarter has now finished, so it's not an encouragement to get involved, you know, to pile on the Kickstarter. But it was looking at an interesting system, and, you know, the whole thing's going to be out end of the year. 
perhaps something for your consideration. OK? Right. I better go. So, thank you very much once again for listening. Uh, take care until next time. Happy gaming, and I'll speak to you very soon. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Meeples and Miniatures podcast. If you want to know more about Meeples and Miniatures, there are several things you can do. First of all, you can visit the website at www.meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. If you want to contact the show at all, you can email me at neil at meeplesandminiatures.co.uk. You can follow the show on Twitter. Simply look for M&M Podcast or click the follow us on Twitter button from the website. We also have a group on Facebook. That's the Meeples and Miniatures Podcast Fan Club. Again, follow the link from the website. And finally, if you want to help us to support the show, you can always donate to the podcast by clicking the PayPal button on the donate page, again, found on the website. Once again, thank you for listening. I hope you've really enjoyed the show. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon.